Welcome back. I am John P. Today we're going to be talking about three watch brands that came out in the 90s, were very hot and desirable for a period of time, to an extent, not quite to the Rolex level, but you get the idea. These were hot brands, and now they're basically defunct. They all exist in some way, shape, or form, but certainly different hands than where they started, as well as different levels of demand and entirely different product lines. Now, this video, I kind of thought of while I was you know, browsing the internet, you know, we buy, sell, trade a lot of watches at DelrayWatch.com, and we just invested a lot more uh, into inventory. We're looking at trying to double our inventory again. We just did it a handful of months ago, and we're looking to double down once again. So, um, you know, I was looking for different brands and things that we could increase our stock on, and these are the brands I found. And if you are looking to, uh, to sell a watch or even buy a watch, of course, make sure to go check out DelrayWatch.com where we can help you with the buying, the selling, the trading. Um, the reality is if there is a watch you're looking for, there's a very good chance that it has come through our door. So make sure to check that out. Um, on the wrist today is actually a Volcane Cricket. It's a vintage uh, Volcane Alarm. And if you're not familiar with these, uh, these vintage watches, there's a modern uh, version of the different Volcane watches as well, but they sound kind of like a cricket. You set it and it's an alarm. You kind of hear that, we'll put it up to the mic. It's kind of a, a running joke among a bunch of uh, different collectors, Charlie, Eric, they love the Volcane Cricket and this is kind of a joke. They'll wind up their watch and you know have it buzz and it's always kind of, kind of funny when it happens. And sometimes it does go off. You know, you could be sitting uh, somewhere and your Cricket will go off. You'll forget you had the time set and it's, it's kind of loud if it's a quiet situation. Uh, so let's get into it, guys. These, these three watch brands have really felt the struggles today of the marketplace for watches being ultra competitive because of things like micro brands and the manufacturers that make these micro brands. They're making the watches for pretty much everyone. So whoever's able to kind of make the thing people are looking for, the, you know, the hot trend, they'll ride that, that tail. And that's what you have today. And so the first brand is Roger Dubuis. Now, right away, I know people that really follow watches or maybe even own a Roger Dubuis are gonna say, oh, that's not true. They're not gonna be defunct. That, that may be the case because today, um, Roger Dubuis is wholly owned by Richemont Group, which owns Jager Lecolt, which owns Vacheron, which owns Panerai, and endless other brands. I mean, let's not forget, uh, let's not forget that this is a very large publicly traded company, and they can certainly afford to let Roger Dubuis stay afloat for as long as they'd like. But if you go to the Roger Dubuis website, it's a much different product catalog than when it started. Roger Dubuis started with a watchmaker, Roger Dubuis, as well as a business person, and they teamed up and they partnered. And I've done previous videos on this in the past, and today, the early Roger Dubuis watches fetch ultimate premiums, and they are more in line with traditional watchmaking and heritage watchmaking. These were watches that were fully Geneva seal, and the watches were produced in the canton or the city of Geneva, uh, and had to meet very strict requirements for the finishing, uh, the types of jewels, uh, the jeweling, and the way that the watches were produced, and they had very strict requirements. The Geneva, steel, uh, Geneva seal rather, still exists, but, Notably, brands such as Patek Philippe have pulled out because of kind of what the uh, the seal started to mean and the way that the brands kind of deviated in the... The Geneva seal brands such as Roger Dubuis kind of deviated from that historical traditional watchmaking in more avant-garde, more modern, and so it just wasn't really... It didn't really make sense to group the watch manufacturers in that way, and Patek Philippe had made statements why they created their own Patek Philippe seal uh, and kind of left behind the Geneva seal. And it's interesting because if you look at the Roger Dubuis catalog, all the watches are $60,000 and up. Hey, fine, no problem. Brands such as Richard Mille do this, but that's exactly who they're targeting. They're trying to offer something that you can buy. You can walk into a boutique or an authorized dealer and you can buy the Roger Dubuis off the shelf, whereas the Richard Mill is incredibly nuanced with the way that you have to source them. Yeah, you can buy third party, but if you want to buy them from an authorized dealer, notably boutiques, uh, for the most part, the authorized dealers in the US have kind of dried up and it's mostly the boutiques, different parts of the world, third parties, things like that, depending on how the business uh, landscape in that country, different parts of the world have different requirements uh, for international companies. Nonetheless, that's what they're aimed at. And it is really mind boggling to myself I've never seen anyone wear a modern Roger Dubuis. So the, the current catalog, you know, maybe a couple of gens ago, they were in this transition period where you can get, you know, some Excaliburs and things that were larger, chunkier, but still 
held on to somewhat of a, um, a more classical watchmaking uh, aesthetic. But today, it's really Richard Mill's style, and people would prefer to have the Richard Mill at that price point. So impulse buys for some maybe in that kind of exclusive realm, but I just don't see this brand being a going concern at all with the current catalog that they have. Maybe if they offered it at a fifth of the price, it would be incredibly attractive. But other than that, I don't see a lot that uh, is really offering bang for buck and the aesthetics you can get from other brands. Let me know what you think about current gen Roger Dubuis below. I mean, I know I went a little bit hard here, but I, it's unfortunate because I really don't like to see when you know a brand that had such great watches in their back catalog abandons it and goes in a different direction, right? If it's not broke, why fix it? Comments below, would love to see it and hear it. Now the next brand, and this is a brand of a watch that I've owned, and I owned this in the 2000s. This is Anonimo. Now, I would wager that many of you have not heard of Anonimo, but I'm sure you've seen them because what happened is essentially they came out with a Panerai alternative watch. Now, this is a brand that came out in about 1997, but so the story goes is when Panerai moved their some of their production facilities out of part of Europe into another part. They kind of left behind a bunch of watchmakers and some of the team, and that team joined Anonimo and go figure. They started producing the, the Panerai-esque watch design and going along the line of that, you know, that Italian uh, Navy dive style vintage Kampf Schwimmer kind of uh, case profile. And I'll say that I even wore one of these and I thought they were like pretty nice for the time. I mean, keep in mind, you know, in the 2000s, you didn't have limitless, endless amounts of watch uh, micro brands being talked about on the blogs and the Hodinkis and the blog to watch endless advertorials in all these places. And that just didn't exist. So you had a couple of micro brand options, this being one of them. Uh, and in that same vein, you also had a company called Magret, if any of you remember, kind of like a Hawaiian uh, inspired or um, at least the Pacific Islands inspired uh, Panerai alternative. Kind of interesting, I know, but they did some cool stuff as well. I'm rambling at this point, but nonetheless, Anonimo, they really just didn't do anything to keep up with the times, unfortunately. I mean, the prices currently look pretty competitive, but they're still selling the same thing, cheaper alternatives to Panerai, but Panerai watches are not super high demand, and in the secondhand market, they often are going for you know a fraction of the retail price, and so it's like, are you gonna buy a brand new Anonimo, or are you going to buy a pre-owned Panerai? I think uh, if you look at it as a Panerai alternative, you're gonna buy the Panerai and it's interesting because Panerai's really not in high demand either. That's a brand that I really do think needs to do a little something different. They're trying with the Douay case, but I think they need to do something at this point. And so to have a copycat brand of a brand that's already kind of stuck in a groove, I don't think personally that's the best strategy. Now keep in mind, I don't have insight into the balance sheet and the profit and loss statements and stuff for Anonimo. I mean, I just don't. So they might do very well in some market, but I can tell you among collectors in the markets that I see and work in, Anonimo is not a thing anymore. I would love to see it and hear it, comments below. And the last brand, and this is a brand that, I'll let you decide what this is a brand for. This is Graham. Now, if you've been on watch shopping sites or you go on the gray market sites or you go on places where you, know, you look for a bit of a deal, Graham is a brand that always comes up because they still kind of adhere and follow that old uh, model of getting rid of old inventory and closing them out and selling them to the different uh, liquidators and wholesalers and things like that. You know, they're still, at least until this point, they were still in that model uh, where you just overproduce, produce as many as you had to, and then, you know, sell some of them maybe at a loss or a break even. Um, but as long as you sold some of them at retail and you sold them to authorized dealers who had to, you know, pay a price, I mean, the brands are making money by selling the watches at wholesale to the authorized dealers, then it's up to the authorized dealers to sell the watches at retail or thereabout and make the profit. So it's, you know, they don't really care if they don't necessarily sell in uh, the authorized dealers, just so long as they can keep finding new authorized dealers to open up uh, you know, a shingle and place the Graham watches in their case. Nonetheless, Graham is a watch brand that you know, they claim was invented in the 1600s by someone that uh, you know essentially designed some of the early earliest timekeeping devices, chronographs. But you know it really wasn't a brand, and 
they kind of take advantage of what some of these micro brands do and you know craft this interesting narrative of this long-standing history but there's like a 300 year gap in the brand but that being said aside from that i always really liked the gram watches you had the gram swordfish uh, which is a chronograph with those big eyes and it kind of looks like you know big fish eyes in kind of a way you had the uh, you had the um the Graham Silverstone, which th those were absolutely blown out clearance. I mean, we're talking brand new, $800, maybe eight, nine years ago. That was very interesting to see. Every single dealer had those, but those were pretty decent watches, especially for the money. And Graham, Graham rode the coattail of this time where interesting crown designs were very in. If you remember the brand U-Boat, which is in a very similar uh status and scenario as as Graham, but they had this kind of crown that had a lever and the lever went down and then it, it was like a crown lock and it was supposed to be like something like a submarine and it's just an interesting way of handling a, basically a crown guard and a crown lock in the vein of Panerai, but even a little bit more intricate, you know, Panerai with the, with the crown guard and the lock there. So it's a very similar thing. They rode this coattail and they made these big chunky crowns with this lever and it looked very steampunk and cool. And once again, they didn't have a lot of micro brands. So this was a very popular brand for a while with that unique and interesting shape. But as time went on, they kind of just kept out of that. And then they just went into this like, you know, essentially aeronautical space where they were focusing on like fighter planes and stuff. And that gets super niche. Breitling, that's what made Breitling uh, like a notable brand is a lot of like aeronautical space flight stylings and branding and partnerships and they've even started to abandon it. And so if it didn't totally work for Breitling, there's a limited amount of people that are really into planes, I guess. If it didn't work for them, why is it gonna work for this tiny little brand that doesn't have you know, that heritage? And so I think this brand should do something interesting. Once again, I don't know exactly what they should do, but I think they are on the right track because now they don't, it's seemingly, at least according to their website, they don't produce the watches and have them sitting around. If you go to the website, they have a little disclaimer that says every watch is made to order. So I think that's interesting. They'll probably interchange some parts, lower their overhead, try to cut down on the amount of losses, cut down on the gray market and not have too many of their, uh, their inventory pieces, their watches floating out there at huge discounts that are tainting uh, the perceived value of the brand. But that being said, these three brands, I think they all do something unique and interesting. They serve an interesting place in the market. And I think if they kind of just change some, some things and you know, maybe adopt a more modern brand strategy as well as come out with a more solid uh, and solidified collection of watches of what us collectors really want, I think they all have the potential. I'd love to see it, uh, especially since all these brands are some earliest brands that I discovered um, in kind of, you know, my journey as an early collector, trying to find something different besides, you know, the Rolex, the Patek Philippe's, uh, so on and so forth. So let me know what you guys think about these brands in the comments below. I love to see it and hear it. You can see more about what I do uh, on my Instagram, the real John P. And do not forget to check out DelrayWatch.com. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. You've been chatting with John P.